Marco Polo listen, Venetian, Marco Polo, Italian, Marco P. Lo, 1254 January 8–9, 1324 was an Italian merchant, explorer, and writer, born in the Republic of Venice. His travels are recorded in Livres des Merveilles du Monde Book of the Marvels of the World, also known as the Travels of Marco Polo, c. 1300, a book that described to Europeans the wealth and great size of China, its capital Peking, and other Asian cities and countries. He learned the mercantile trade from his father and his uncle, Niccolo and Mafio, who traveled through Asia and met Kublai Khan. In 1269, they returned to Venice to meet Marco for the first time. The three of them embarked on an epic journey to Asia, returning after 24 years to find Venice at war with Genoa. Marco was imprisoned and dictated his stories to a cellmate. He was released in 1299, became a wealthy merchant, married, and had three children. He died in 1324 and was buried in the Church of San Lorenzo in Venice. Though he was not the first European to reach China see Europeans in medieval China, Marco Polo was the first to leave a detailed chronicle of his experience. This book inspired Christopher Columbus and many other travelers. There is a substantial literature based on Polo's writings. He also influenced European cartography, leading to the introduction of the Fra Mauro map. Topic. Life Topic. Family origin Marco Polo was born in 1254 in the Republic of Venice. His exact date and place of birth are archivally unknown. Some historians mentioned that he was born on September 15. But that date is not endorsed by mainstream scholarship. Marco Polo's birthplace is generally considered Venice, but also varies between Constantinople and the island of Corchula. There is dispute as to whether the Polo family is of Venetian origin, as Venetian historical sources considered them to be of Dalmatian origin. The lack of evidence makes the Corchula theory probably under Ramusio influence as a specific birthplace strongly disputed, and even some Croatian scholars consider it justly invented. Early life and Asian travel In 1168, his great-uncle, Marco Polo, borrowed money and commanded a ship in Constantinople. His grandfather, Andrea Polo of the parish of San Felice, had three sons, Mafio, yet another Marco, and the traveler's father Niccolo. This genealogy, described by Ramusio, is not universally accepted as there is no additional evidence to support it. His father, Niccolo Polo, a merchant, traded with the Near East, becoming wealthy and achieving great prestige. Niccolo and his brother Mafio set off on a trading voyage before Marco's birth. In 1260, Niccolo and Mafio, while residing in Constantinople, then the capital of the Latin Empire, foresaw a political change, they liquidated their assets into jewels and moved away. According to the travels of Marco Polo, they passed through much of Asia, and met with Kublai Khan, a Mongol ruler and founder of the Yuan dynasty. Their decision to leave Constantinople proved timely. In 1261 Michael VIII Palaiologos, the ruler of the Empire of Nicaea, took Constantinople, promptly burned the Venetian quarter and re-established the Eastern Roman Empire. Captured Venetian citizens were blinded, while many of those who managed to escape perished aboard overloaded refugee ships fleeing to other Venetian colonies in the Aegean Sea. Almost nothing is known about the childhood of Marco Polo until he was 15 years old, excepting that he probably spent part of his childhood in Venice. Meanwhile, Marco Polo's mother died, and an aunt and uncle raised him. He received a good education, learning mercantile subjects including foreign currency, appraising, and the handling of cargo ships. He learned little or no Latin. His father later married Floridice Polo in 1269. Niccolo and Mafio returned to their families in Venice, meeting young Marco for the first time. In 1271, during the rule of Doge Lorenzo Tipolo, Marco Polo, at 17 years of age, his father, and his uncle set off for Asia on the series of adventures that Marco later documented in his book. They returned to Venice in 1295, 24 years later, with many riches and treasures. They had traveled almost 15,000 miles 24,000 kilometers. Topic. Genoese captivity and later life Marco Polo returned to Venice in 1295 with his fortune converted into gemstones. At this time, Venice was at war with the Republic of Genoa. 
Polo armed a galley equipped with a trebuchet to join the war. He was probably caught by Genoans in a skirmish in 1296, off the Anatolian coast between Adana and the Gulf of Alexandretta and not during the Battle of Kerzola September 1298, off the Dalmatian coast. The latter claim is due to a later tradition 16th century recorded by Giovanni Battista Ramusio. He spent several months of his imprisonment dictating a detailed account of his travels to a fellow inmate, Rusticello da Pisa, who incorporated tales of his own as well as other collected anecdotes and current affairs from China. The book soon spread throughout Europe in manuscript form, and became known as The Travels of Marco Polo. It depicts the Polo's journeys throughout Asia, giving Europeans their first comprehensive look into the inner workings of the Far East, including China, India, and Japan. Polo was finally released from captivity in August 1299, and returned home to Venice, where his father and uncle in the meantime had purchased a large palazzo in the zone named Contrada San Giovanni Crisostomo. Corte del Milion. For such a venture, the Polo family probably invested profits from trading, and even many gemstones they brought from the East. The company continued its activities and Marco soon became a wealthy merchant. Marco and his uncle Mafio financed other expeditions, but likely never left Venetian provinces, nor returned to the Silk Road and Asia. Sometime before 1300, his father Niccolo died. In 1300, he married Donata Badoer, the daughter of Vitali Badoer, a merchant. They had three daughters, Fantina married Marco Bragadin, Bellela married Bertuccio Quirini, and Moreta. In 1305 he is mentioned in a Venetian document among local sea captains regarding the payment of taxes. His relation with a certain Marco Polo, who in 1300 was mentioned with riots against the aristocratic government, and escaped the death penalty, as well as riots from 1310 led by Bahamonte Tipolo by mother side grandson of Trogir Count Stiepko Subic and Marco Quirini, among whose rebels were Jacobello and Francesco Polo from another family branch, is unclear. Polo is clearly mentioned again after 1305 in Mafio's Testament from 1309 to 1310, in a 1319 document according to which he became owner of some estates of his deceased father, and in 1321, when he bought part of the family property of his wife Donata. <laughs> Death In 1323, Polo was confined to bed, due to illness. On January 8, 1324, despite physicians' efforts to treat him, Polo was on his deathbed. To write and certify the will, his family requested Giovanni Giustiniani, a priest of San Procolo. His wife, Donata, and his three daughters were appointed by him as co-executrices. The church was entitled by law to a portion of his estate, he approved of this and ordered that a further sum be paid to the convent of San Lorenzo, the place where he wished to be buried. He also set free Peter, a Tartar servant, who may have accompanied him from Asia, and to whom Polo bequeathed 100 lire of Venetian denarii. He divided up the rest of his assets, including several properties, among individuals, religious institutions, and every guild and fraternity to which he belonged. He also wrote off multiple debts including 300 lire that his sister-in-law owed him, and others for the convent of San Giovanni, San Paolo of the Order of Preachers, and a cleric named Friar Benvenuto. He ordered 220 soldi be paid to Giovanni Giustiniani for his work as a notary and his prayers. The will was not signed by Polo, but was validated by the then relevant signum manus rule, by which the testator only had to touch the document to make it legally valid. Due to the Venetian law stating that the day ends at sunset, the exact date of Marco Polo's death cannot be determined, but according to some scholars, it was between the sunsets of January 8 and 9, 1324. Biblioteca Marciana, which holds the original copy of his testament, dates the testament in January 9, 1323, and gives the date of his death at some time in June 1324. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Travels of Marco Polo. An authoritative version of Marco Polo's book does not and cannot exist, for the early manuscripts differ significantly. The published editions of his book either rely on single manuscripts, blend multiple versions together, or add notes to clarify, for example in the English translation by Henry Yule. The 1938 English translation by A.C. Mole and Paul Pelliot is based on a Latin manuscript found in the library of the Cathedral of Toledo in 1932, and is 50% longer than other versions. 
Approximately 150 manuscript copies in various languages are known to exist, and before availability of the printing press discrepancies were inevitably introduced during copying and translation. The popular translation published by Penguin Books in 1958 by R. E. Latham works several texts together to make a readable whole. Polo related his memoirs orally to Rusticello da Pisa while both were prisoners of the Geneva Republic. Rusticello wrote Devisement du Monde in Longs d'Oil, a lingua franca of crusaders and western merchants in the Orient. The idea probably was to create a handbook for merchants, essentially a text on weights, measures and distances. Topic. Narrative The book opens with a preface describing his father and uncle traveling to Bolgar where Prince Burke Khan lived. A year later, they went to Yukik and continued to Bukhara. There, an envoy from the Levant invited them to meet Kublai Khan, who had never met Europeans. In 1266, they reached the seat of Kublai Khan at Dadu, present-day Beijing, China. Kublai received the brothers with hospitality and asked them many questions regarding the European legal and political system. He also inquired about the Pope and Church in Rome. After the brothers answered the questions he tasked them with delivering a letter to the Pope, requesting 100 Christians acquainted with the seven arts grammar, rhetoric, logic, geometry, arithmetic, music and astronomy. Kublai Khan requested that an envoy bring him back oil of the lamp in Jerusalem. The long seed vacante between the death of Pope Clement IV in 1268 and the election of his successor delayed the Polos in fulfilling Kublai's request. They followed the suggestion of Theobald Visconti, then papal legate for the realm of Egypt, and returned to Venice in 1269 or 1270 to await the nomination of the new pope, which allowed Marco to see his father for the first time. At the age of 15 or 16, in 1271, Niccolo, Maffio, and Marco Polo embarked on their voyage to fulfill Kublai's request. They sailed to Acre, and then rode on camels to the Persian port of Hormuz. The Polos wanted to sail straight into China, but the ships there were not seaworthy, so they continued overland through the Silk Road, until reaching Kublai's summer palace in Chengdu, near present-day Zhangjiakou. In one instance during their trip, the Polos joined a caravan of traveling merchants whom they crossed paths with. Unfortunately, the party was soon attacked by bandits, who used the cover of a sandstorm to ambush them. The Polos managed to fight and escape through a nearby town, but many members of the caravan were killed or enslaved. Three and a half years after leaving Venice, when Marco was about 21 years old, the Polos were welcomed by Kublai into his palace. The exact date of their arrival is unknown, but scholars estimate it to be between 1271 and 1275. On reaching the Yuan court, the Polos presented the sacred oil from Jerusalem and the papal letters to their patron. Marco knew four languages, and the family had accumulated a great deal of knowledge and experience that was useful to Kublai. It is possible that he became a government official. He wrote about many imperial visits to China's southern and eastern provinces, the far south and Burma. They were highly respected and sought after in the Mongolian court, and so Kublai Khan decided to decline the Polo's requests to leave China. They became worried about returning home safely, believing that if Kublai died, his enemies might turn against them because of their close involvement with the ruler. In 1292, Kublai's great-nephew, then ruler of Persia, sent representatives to China in search of a potential wife, and they asked the Polos to accompany them, so they were permitted to return to Persia with the wedding party—which left that same year from Zaitun in southern China on a fleet of 14 junks. The party sailed to the port of Singapore, traveled north to Sumatra, and sailed west to the Point Pedro port of Jaffna under Savakanmaindan and to Pandyan of Tomalakam. Eventually Polo crossed the Arabian Sea to Hormuz. The two-year voyage was a perilous one. Of the 600 people not including the crew in the convoy only 18 had survived including all three Polos. The Polos left the wedding party after reaching Hormuz and traveled overland to the port of Trebizond on the Black Sea, the present-day Trabzon. Topic. Role of Rusticello The British scholar Ronald Latham has pointed out that the Book of Marvels was in fact a collaboration written in 1298–1299 between Polo and a professional writer of romances, Rusticello of Pisa. Latham also argued that Rusticello may have glamorized Polo's accounts, and added fantastic and romantic elements that made the book a bestseller. 
The Italian scholar Luigi Foscolo Benedetto had previously demonstrated that the book was written in the same leisurely, conversational style that characterized Rusticello's other works, and that some passages in the book were taken verbatim or with minimal modifications from other writings by Rusticello. For example, the opening introduction in the Book of Marvels to Emperors and Kings, Dukes and Marquises was lifted straight out of an Arthurian romance Rusticello had written several years earlier, and the account of the second meeting between Polo and Kublai Khan at the latter's court is almost the same as that of the arrival of Tristan at the court of King Arthur at Camelot in that same book. Latham believed that many elements of the book, such as legends of the Middle East and mentions of exotic marvels, may have been the work of Rusticello who was giving what medieval European readers expected to find in a travel book. Topic. Authenticity and veracity Since its publication, some have viewed the book with skepticism. Some in the Middle Ages regarded the book simply as a romance or fable, due largely to the sharp difference of its descriptions of a sophisticated civilization in China to other early accounts by Giovanni da Pian del Carpine and William of Rubric who portrayed the Mongols as barbarians who appeared to belong to some other world. Doubts have also been raised in later centuries about Marco Polo's narrative of his travels in China, for example for his failure to mention the Great Wall of China, and in particular the difficulties in identifying many of the place names he used the great majority, however, have since been identified. Many have questioned if he had visited the places he mentioned in his itinerary, if he had appropriated the accounts of his father and uncle or other travelers, and some doubted if he even reached China, or that if he did, perhaps never went beyond Konbalik Beijing. It has however been pointed out that Polo's accounts of China are more accurate and detailed than other travelers' accounts of the periods. Polo had at times refuted the marvelous fables and legends given in other European accounts, and despite some exaggerations and errors, Polo's accounts have relatively few of the descriptions of irrational marvels. In many cases where present mostly given in the first part before he reached China, such as mentions of Christian miracles, he made a clear distinction that they are what he had heard rather than what he had seen. It is also largely free of the gross errors found in other accounts such as those given by the Moroccan traveller Ibn Battuta who had confused the Yellow River with the Grand Canal and other waterways, and believed that porcelain was made from coal. Modern studies have further shown that details given in Marco Polo's book, such as the currencies used, salt productions and revenues, are accurate and unique. Such detailed descriptions are not found in other non-Chinese sources, and their accuracy is supported by archaeological evidence as well as Chinese records compiled after Polo had left China. His accounts are therefore unlikely to have been obtained second-hand. Other accounts have also been verified, for example, when visiting Junjiang in Jiangsu, China, Marco Polo noted that a large number of Christian churches had been built there. His claim is confirmed by a Chinese text of the 14th century explaining how a Sogdian named Mar Sargas from Samarkand founded six Nestorian Christian churches there in addition to one in Hangzhou during the second half of the 13th century. His story of the princess Kokochen sent from China to Persia to marry the Il Khan is also confirmed by independent sources in both Persia and China. Topic. Written works. Topic. Omissions Skeptics have long wondered if Marco Polo wrote his book based on hearsay, with some pointing to omissions about noteworthy practices and structures of China as well as the lack of details on some places in his book. While Polo describes paper money and the burning of coal, he fails to mention the Great Wall of China, tea, Chinese characters, chopsticks, or footbinding. His failure to note the presence of the Great Wall of China was first raised in the middle of 17th century, and in the middle of 18th century, it was suggested that he might have never reached China. Later scholars such as John W. Hager argued the Marco Polo might not have visited southern China due to the lack of details in his description of southern Chinese cities compared to northern ones, while Herbert Frank also raised the possibility that Marco Polo might not have been to China at all, and wondered if he might have based his accounts on Persian sources due to his use of Persian expressions. This is taken further by Dr. Francis Wood who claimed in her 1995 book Did Marco Polo Go to China, that at best Polo never went farther east than Persia modern Iran, and that there is nothing in the Book of Marvels about China that could not be obtained via reading Persian books. 
Wood maintains that it is more probable that Polo only went to Constantinople modern Istanbul, Turkey, and some of the Italian merchant colonies around the Black Sea, picking hearsay from those travellers who had been farther east. Supporters of the book's basic accuracy countered on the points raised by skeptics such as footbinding and the Great Wall of China. Historian Stephen G. Ha argued that the Great Walls were built to keep out northern invaders, whereas the ruling dynasty during Marco Polo's visit were those very northern invaders. They note that the Great Wall familiar to us today is a Ming structure built some two centuries after Marco Polo's travels, and that the Mongol rulers whom Polo served controlled territories both north and south of today's wall, and would have no reasons to maintain any fortifications that may have remained there from the earlier dynasties. Other Europeans who traveled to Konbalik during the Yuan dynasty, such as Giovanni de Marinoli and Odoric of Perdinone, said nothing about the wall either. The Muslim traveler Ibn Battuta, who asked about the wall when he visited China during the Yuan dynasty, could find no one who had either seen it or knew of anyone who had seen it, suggesting that while ruins of the wall constructed in the earlier periods might have existed, they were not significant or noteworthy at that time. Ha also argued that footbinding was not common even among Chinese during Polo's time and almost unknown among the Mongols. While the Italian missionary Odoric of Perdinone who visited Yuan China mentioned footbinding, it is however unclear whether he was merely relaying something he had heard as his description is inaccurate. No other foreign visitors to Yuan China mentioned the practice, perhaps an indication that the footbinding was not widespread or was not practiced in an extreme form at that time. Marco Polo himself noted in the Toledo manuscript the dainty walk of Chinese women who took very short steps. It has also been noted by other scholars that many of the things not mentioned by Marco Polo such as tea and chopsticks were not mentioned by other travelers as well. Ha also pointed out that despite the few omissions, Marco Polo's account is more extensive, more accurate and more detailed than those of other foreign travelers to China in this period. Marco Polo even observed Chinese nautical inventions such as the watertight compartments of bulkhead partitions in Chinese ships, knowledge of which he was keen to share with his fellow Venetians. Topic. Exaggerations Many scholars believe that Marco Polo exaggerated his importance in China. The British historian David Morgan thought that Polo had likely exaggerated and lied about his status in China, while Ronald Latham believed that such exaggerations were embellishments by his ghostwriter Rusticello da Pisa. In the Book of Marvels, Polo claimed that he was a close friend and advisor to Kublai Khan and that he was the governor of the city of Yangzhou for three years, yet no Chinese source mentions him as either a friend of the emperor or as the governor of Yangzhou, indeed no Chinese source mentions Marco Polo at all. Herbert Frank noted that all occurrences of Po Lo or Bolod an Altaic word meaning steel in Yuan texts were names of people of Mongol or Turkic extraction. The sinologist Paul Pelliot thought that Polo might have served as an officer of the government salt monopoly in Yangzhou, which was a position of some significance that could explain the exaggeration. Polo also claimed to have provided the Mongols with technical advice on building mangonels during the siege of Xiangyang, a claim that cannot possibly be true as the siege was over before Polo had arrived in China. The Mongol army that besieged Xiangyang did have foreign military engineers, but they were mentioned in Chinese sources as being from Baghdad and had Arabic names. Stephen G. Ha, however, challenges this idea that Polo exaggerated his own importance, writing that, Contrary to what has often been said, Marco does not claim any very exalted position for himself in the Yuan Empire. He points out that Marco never claimed to be a minister of high rank, a darugachi, a leader of a tuman i.e. 10,000 men, not even the leader of 1,000 men, only that he was an emissary for the Khan and held a position of some honor. Ha sees this as a reasonable claim if Marco was a keshig, who numbered some 14,000 at the time. Ha explains how the earliest manuscripts of Polo's accounts provide contradicting information about his role in Yangzhou, with some stating he was just a simple resident, others stating he was a governor, and Ramusio's manuscript claiming he was simply holding that office as a temporary substitute for someone else, yet all the manuscripts concur that he worked as an esteemed emissary for the Khan. Ha also objected to the approach to finding mention of Marco Polo in Chinese texts, contending that contemporaneous Europeans had little regard for using surnames, and a direct Chinese transcription of the name, Marco, ignores the possibility of him taking on a Chinese or even Mongol name that had no bearing or similarity with his Latin name. <laughs> Errors 
A number of errors in Marco Polo's account have been noted, for example, he described the bridge later known as Marco Polo Bridge as having 24 arches instead of 11 or 13. He also said that city wall of Convalik had 12 gates when it had only 11. Archaeologists have also pointed out that Polo may have mixed up the details from the two attempted invasions of Japan by Kublai Khan in 1274 and 1281. Polo wrote of five masted ships, when archaeological excavations found that the ships in fact had only three masts. Topic. Appropriation Wood accused Marco Polo of taking other people's accounts in his book, retelling other stories as his own, or basing his accounts on Persian guidebooks or other lost sources. For example, sinologist Francis Woodman Cleves noted that Polo's account of the voyage of the Princess Kokochin from China to Persia to marry the Il Khan in 1293 has been confirmed by a passage in the 15th century Chinese work Yongle Encyclopedia and by the Persian historian Rashid al Din Hamadani in his work Jamie al Tawarik. However neither of these accounts mentions Polo or indeed any European as part of the bridal party, and Wood used the lack of mention of Polo in these works as an example of Polo's retelling of a well-known tale. Morgan, in Polo's defense, noted that even the princess herself was not mentioned in the Chinese source, and that it would have been surprising if Polo had been mentioned by Rashid al-Din. Historian Igor de Rachelwiltz argued that Marco Polo's account in fact allows the Persian and Chinese sources to be reconciled, by relaying the information that two of the three envoys sent mentioned in the Chinese source and whose names accord with those given by Polo had died during the voyage. It explains why only the third who survived, Koha, Koja, was mentioned by Rashid al-Din. Polo had therefore completed the story by providing information not found in either source. He also noted that the only Persian source that mentions the princess was not completed until 1310-11, therefore Marco Polo could not have learned the information from any Persian book. According to de Rachelwiltz, the concordance of Polo's detailed account of the princess with other independent sources that gave only incomplete information is proof of the veracity of Polo's story and his presence in China. Topic. Assessments. Morgan writes that since much of what the Book of Marvels has to say about China is demonstrably correct, that to claim that Polo did not go to China creates far more problems than it solves, and so that the balance of probabilities strongly suggests that Polo really did go to China, even if he exaggerated somewhat his importance in China. Ha dismisses the various anachronistic criticisms of Polo's accounts that started in the 17th century, and highlights Polo's accuracy in great part of his accounts, for example on the lay of the land such as the Grand Canal of China. If Marco was a liar, Ha writes, then he must have been an implausibly meticulous one. In 2012, the University of Tübingen sinologist and historian Hans Ulrich Vogel released a detailed analysis of Polo's description of currencies, salt production and revenues, and argued that the evidence supports his presence in China because he included details which he could not have otherwise known. Vogel noted that no other Western, Arab, or Persian sources have given such accurate and unique details about the currencies of China, for example, the shape and size of the paper, the use of seals, the various denominations of paper money as well as variations in currency usage in different regions of China, such as the use of cowrie shells in Yunnan, details supported by archaeological evidence and Chinese sources compiled long after Polos had left China. His accounts of salt production and revenues from the salt monopoly are also accurate, and accord with Chinese documents of the Yuan era. Economic historian Mark Elvin, in his preface to Vogel's 2013 monograph, concludes that Vogel "...demonstrates by specific example after specific example the ultimately overwhelming probability of the broad authenticity." of Polo's account. Many problems were caused by the oral transmission of the original text and the proliferation of significantly different hand-copied manuscripts. For instance, did Polo exert political authority in Yangzhou or merely sojourn sojourna there? Elvin concludes that those who doubted, although mistaken, were not always being casual or foolish. But the case as a whole had now been closed. The book is, in essence, authentic, and, when used with care, in broad terms to be trusted as a serious though obviously not always final, witness. Legacy 
Topic. Further exploration Other lesser-known European explorers had already travelled to China, such as Giovanni da Pian del Carpine, but Polo's book meant that his journey was the first to be widely known. Christopher Columbus was inspired enough by Polo's description of the Far East to want to visit those lands for himself. A copy of the book was among his belongings, with handwritten annotations. Bento de Gua, inspired by Polo's writings of a Christian kingdom in the East, traveled 4,000 miles in three years across Central Asia. He never found the kingdom but ended his travels at the Great Wall of China in 1605, proving that Cathay was what Matteo Ricci called China. Cartography Marco Polo's travels may have had some influence on the development of European cartography, ultimately leading to the European voyages of exploration a century later. The 1453 Fra Mauro map was said by Giovanni Battista Ramusio disputed by historian, cartographer Piero Falcetta, in whose work the quote appears to have been partially based on the one brought from Cathay by Marco Polo, that fine illuminated world map on parchment, which can still be seen in a large cabinet alongside the choir of their monastery the Camaldolese Monastery of San Michele di Murano was by one of the brothers of the monastery, who took great delight in the study of cosmography, diligently drawn and copied from a most beautiful and very old nautical map and a world map that had been brought from Cathay by the most honorable Messer Marco Polo and his father. Though Marco Polo never produced a map that illustrated his journey, his family drew several maps to the Far East based on the Wayward's accounts. These collection of maps were signed by Polo's three daughters, Fantina, Belela and Moreta. Not only did it contain maps of his journey, but also sea routes to Japan, Siberia's Kamchatka Peninsula, the Bering Strait and even to the coastlines of Alaska, centuries before the rediscovery of the Americas by Europeans. Topic. Commemoration The Marco Polo sheep, a subspecies of Ovis Ammon, is named after the explorer, who described it during his crossing of Pamir ancient Mount Imian in 1271. In 1851, a three-masted clipper built in St. John, New Brunswick also took his name. The Marco Polo was the first ship to sail around the world in under six months. The airport in Venice is named Venice Marco Polo Airport. The frequent flyer program of Hong Kong flag carrier Cathay Pacific is known as the Marco Polo Club. Topic arts, entertainment, and media Topic Film The Adventures of Marco Polo 1938, Marco Polo 1961, Topic Games The game Marco Polo is a form of tag played in a swimming pool or on land, with slightly modified rules. Polo appears as a great explorer in the strategy video game Civilization Revolution 2008. Marco Polo's 1292 voyage from China is used as a backdrop for the plot of Uncharted 2, Among Thieves 2009, where Nathan Drake the protagonist searches for the Sintamani Stone, which was from the fabled city of Shambhala. A board game the Voyages of Marco Polo plays over a map of Eurasia, with multiple routes to recreate Polo's journey. Topic literature The travels of Marco Polo are fictionalized in a number of works, such as, Brian Oswald Don Burns Messer Marco Polo 1921, Italo Calvino's novel Invisible Cities 1972, in which Polo appears as a pivotal character. Gary Jennings' novel The Journeyer 1984, Avram Davidson's novel written with Grania Davis Marco Polo and the Sleeping Beauty 1988, a serio-comic fantasy with Polo as the protagonist. James Rollins' Sigma Force Book 4, The Judas Strain 2007, in which facts about Polo's travels and conjecture about secrets he kept are interleaved with modern-day action. Topic television The television miniseries, Marco Polo 1982, featuring Ken Marshall and Ruaocheng Ying, and directed by Giuliano Montaldo, depicts Polo's travels. It won two Emmy Awards, and was nominated for six more. The television film, Marco Polo 2007, starring Brian Dennehy as Kublai Khan, and Ian Summerhalder as Marco, portrays Marco Polo being left alone in China while his uncle and father returned to Venice, to be reunited with him many years later. In the footsteps of Marco Polo 2009 is a PBS documentary about two friends Dennis Bellivo and Francis O'Donnell who conceived of the ultimate road trip to retrace Marco Polo's journey from Venice to China via land and sea. 
Marco Polo was a television drama series about Marco Polo's early years in the court of Kublai Khan which premiered on Netflix in December 2014 and was cancelled in 2016. Topic see also Chinese expeditions to the Sinhala Kingdom Chronology of European Exploration of Asia Rabin Bar Sama, Uyghur Nestorian Christian monk from Jiangdu Konbalik, modern Beijing, who led a Mongol diplomatic mission to medieval European monarchs and the Pope, visiting Greece, Italy, and France Silk Road, which Marco Polo traveled Caterina Viglioni d. 1342, an Italian woman whose tombstone was found in Yangzhou, China Topic Notes Topic References Topic Bibliography Topic Further reading Mark Marco Polo 1918. Marsden, William, ed. The Travels of Marco Polo. London, J. M. Dent & Sons. p. 461. Hart, H. Henry 1948. Marco Polo, Venetian Adventurer. Kessinger Publishing. Dalrymple, William 1989. In Xanadu. Daftari, Farhad 1994. The Assassin Legends, Myths of the Ismailis 2 ed. I. B. Tories. P. 213. ISBN 978-1850437055. Otfinowski, Stephen Marco Polo, To China and Back. New York, Benchmark Books. ISBN 978-0761414803. Polo, Marco and Rustichello of Pisa January 1, 2004. The Travels of Marco Polo, Volume 1. Project Gutenberg. Retrieved April 2, 2011, CS1 maint, uses author's parameter link Polo, Marco and Rustichello of Pisa May 1, 2004. The Travels of Marco Polo, Volume 2. Project Gutenberg. Retrieved April 2, 2011, CS1 maint, uses author's parameter link Olivier Weber, Sur les routes de la SOIE on the Silk Roads with Reza, Hobaki, 2007 Yang, Dory Jones, 2011. Daughter of Xanadu. De La Corte Press Books for Young Readers. ISBN 978-0385739238. Young Adult Novel Topic. External links Marco Polo at Curly Marco Polo on IMDb Marco Polo's House in Venice, near the Church of San Giovanni Grisostomo National Geographic Marco Polo, Journey from Venice to China Works by Marco Polo at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Marco Polo at Internet Archive Works by Marco Polo at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks